So, good. welcome everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We are so delighted to have you here at the 26th Forum. And it's a few days when we'll come together and all teach, all learn, we'll innovate and inspire and engage. And the energy in the room is just so amazing already that both Derek and I are so delighted to be able to share this with you. The last board meeting that we had of IHI, we looked back, as Gary said, over the last 25 years, and we started to think about the kinds of improvements that we've been making uh, with you around the world. We had celebrated success in safety, we looked at some improvements in flow, and certainly I think care is more patient-centered than it has been in the past. And then we looked forward at the next 25 years, as Gary said, at what are the gaps that we still need to close. Paul Batalden, who is a founder of IHI, <clears throat> a mentor to so many people in this room and internationally, and a guide for me, kicked us off. And he asked us this challenging question. He said, what is it that you make in healthcare? And he pushed us to move from thinking about giving care to really thinking about co-design and co-production. He said that the assets that our patients and families bring, that every team member brings, together we could work in a different way to produce health and health care. And then <clears throat> Annie Milstein, a researcher and an innovator in one person, pushed us to accelerate the velocity of improvement. We started to think, Derek and I with the board, about our moral imperative to decrease disparities and inequities in healthcare, to close those gaps, particularly in the United States, but globally. We talked about the need to create a real learning health system. We talked about the need to think about partnering with patients and families in a different way so that we understand not only the burden of the illness, but how we can redesign care to decrease the burden of the treatment. We talked about restoring joy to the workforce, and then the discussion got lively. So we had all of these challenges on our plate. So Derek and I decided that we would go out and try and find the bright spots globally to try and find out where the answers were. And this is what we found. We found that where there was confusion, where there was slow improvement, where there was a sense of culture that was holding people back, we found what Jim Collins would call the, the black or white thinking, the tyranny of the or. We found in those places where people were held back from progress, that there was a sense that people were making choices and you would hear in the leaders' conversations or you would hear at the front line of nursing care, you would hear people saying, it's me or it's you. It's cost or it's quality. It's short term or it's long term. It's administration or it's medical. It's us or them, it's win or lose. And that kind of a sense really gave us a, a real visual on where we saw the tyranny of the ore. Then, on the other hand, we visited places where we did see the bright spots. And it was a whole different sense of leadership, a whole different sense of culture. And here, we saw the genius of the end. Here, we saw patients and families partnered with providers. We saw clinical evidence used every single day with improvement science. We saw quality improvement and lean, PDSAs and value stream maps. We saw people who came together and said, we can partner in a totally different way. We saw the genius of the and. And so we decided that we should model and, and that we should speak to you together today. And so that's why Derek and I decided to come to the stage together and to talk to you about how we can move to the next generation by thinking about the genius of the and. And is the new or. We've got all these opportunities to move away from or thinking and to look at the assets in this room, in our organizations, in our communities. And when we start to think and, we're going to break down boundaries, we're going to create new partnerships, and we're going to find new ways in order to move this forward. So this morning, Derek and I are going to take you on a journey, and we're going to give you four ands that will help us to get to the next generation of healthcare. Derek. Yeah, that's right, Maureen. Four ways to thrive in the new world. 
but before we get into that, I have to confess, I, I am a little bit nervous about the accent. It's okay, Derek. I, I can translate for you. Yeah. So, so I was worried about your accent, not mine. <laughs> Okay, I well, have, have been told I have a, for Maureen. I, I've been told I have a small Boston accent, and we'll translate for we'll, each other. We'll help each other. All right. Uh, and as the new R, we've been trying to put that in place in IHI strategic thinking. And so, if you just focus on those two big blue dots in our one-page strategic plan, you can see that what we're trying to do here is take up Arnie Milstein's challenge and really accelerate the pace of improvement in healthcare. And IHI will never be done standing by your side working to accelerate the pace of improvement in healthcare. However, at the same time, and as well as doing that fabulous work around improving healthcare, we need to also innovate and partner with organizations and communities to improve health. And so that is the first of our ands, the first of our ways to thrive in the new world, is to work to improve health care and to improve health. Maureen, you're going to kick us off. So I'll kick us off by talking about improving health care. And as I mentioned, we have made a lot of progress in these last 25 years. I think we're seeing care that's safer and more person-centered. We're seeing care that's improved in efficiency and effectiveness. And yet the complexity of care is, improving at, is increasing at the same time. So we just still do have some big gaps to close. I think we need to build learning healthcare systems so that all of this knowledge becomes integrated at a system level. It's impossible for us as human beings to deal with the pace of change. So it's going to require leaders to think in a very different way about the systems of care that will allow us to provide the compassion in care. So we need, I think, improvements in healthcare, safety, flow, efficiency, and effectiveness. Those are system problems, those are leadership challenges. And that will allow us as human beings, as carers, to build our own resilience, and that will allow us to get to human care. We, about 10 years ago almost, just on this stage at the forum, we launched the IHI 100,000 Lives campaign. And I do think that that campaign helped to accelerate the pace of improvement. I think it created a new way for us to work in the United States and then globally to, to think about safety in a different way. We started to see ventilator pneumonia as preventable harm and started to look at different ways that we could work with bundles in order to improve care. And we had some tremendous results. I think care has changed in these last 10 years as a result of the work that all of us have done together. And I'm sure that you saw recently the ARC research on the results of CMS's partnership for patients making improvements in care in these last several years. I think that you can take some, some pride and some joy to take a look at the kind of changes that we're making, not in one place, but in hospitals across the whole country. And I think we can all take pride, as Don Berwick said on this stage 10 years ago, that 50,000 people will get to go to a graduation or a wedding that they might not have been able to go to. And he talked about these people who may get to spend time with a grandparent that they may never have seen without the work that we're all doing here. And yet I'm going to push us because as great as that progress has been, I think our definitions about safety have been narrow and limited. And now that we've got that track record behind us, we can start to think in a new, more expansive way about safety. So recently, uh, Derek led a, a trip down to NASA's command center in Houston, and we began to think in a very different way about what healthcare safety might look like. J uh, John James recently came up with a new framing for us to think about new ways to see harm. And he's talking about errors of commission as well as errors of omission, errors of communication, errors of context, and diagnostic errors. And I'm adding a different one at the bottom, which is errors in failing to care safely across the continuum. So going to NASA allowed us to ask this question, what do all of these failures look like? And when you walk into NASA down in Houston, 
you see a big map on the wall. As you look at this map on the wall, time is across the bottom. From the time a space shuttle comes out onto the launch pad on the left, all the way until it's safely returned at home on the right, and distance from Earth is top to bottom. What this map told us is that we can, in one place, look at harm, employee injuries, risks, uh, near misses, and really get a sense of where in the journey of a rocket do we see the greatest risks, where do we see the greatest harm, and how do we prevent these kind of safety problems. So what would it look like if we had a similar map for healthcare? Could we track the risks in a year of a life of a patient with multiple chronic conditions? Or could we look at this map as providing a sense of risks over the life of a person? What are the risks in the first hours of life? What are the risks that an adolescent suffers? And where are we most vulnerable in the frail end of life uh, days and weeks and, and years? Could we look at, as an example, an older person who stays in a bed because we have failed in queuing theory or reliability to find the next place for them, that that person is going to lose 1% of muscle mass per day by being bedridden. Do we see that as our safety failing? Or do we look at a patient who's got multiple prescriptions from different providers who now ends up falling and having a risk fracture? Can we see that as our safety problem? I think we can map risks at every part of a hospitalization. We could take the NASA map as a view of hospital system safety and look at failures of connecting appropriately with primary care that cause uh, tests to be repeated on admission as a safety problem. And do we understand fully the context of a patient and family at home to know that we're safely guiding that patient to the next part of the journey? So at IHI, we're working on improving safety. We've got a wonderful, innovative team that's spending time thinking about what is the safety system across the continuum for our, our uh, patients. And we're working on improving flow. As Derek and I have traveled the world this year, we have found in every place we visited flow problems. So we're looking at flow. Once we get these technical problems fixed, we're thinking about how can then we support you, the individuals who are providing care in many cases, to work on empathy and compassion. I don't know if you saw the recent, uh, recent research from Stanford on kindness. And this is a, an amazing bit of research that shows that in many cases, kindness is more effective than an aspirin in preventing a heart attack. And kindness can be more effective than preventing smoking in a male adult for heart failure. So I think how do we balance this system of safety, re-engineering flow, to provide a way for all of us as individuals to be free from the burdens of our care and provide kindness, provide compassion and empathy. Derek and I are going to talk this morning about this piece of our redesign work as being what an individual can bring. The system's work is on the leaders, but the kindness and the compassion is on the individuals. And what we're finding around the world is that individuals are finding their own resilience, their own joy, by stepping up and caring with kindness and compassion. I wanted to share with you this morning one example of what this can look like when an individual steps forward to add technical skills with kindness and compassion. And this is an example from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Really considering the heartbeat as the most beautiful sound that I think is possible. And, and when I'm thinking of rhythm, it's our basic beats. So me using that as our foundation to create something that could preserve the humanity of a situation has been a focus of mine. The worry that a lot of families I work with that they would forget um, something like um, the way that they feel or the touch of their hand, it's 
it's my job as a creative arts therapist to find pieces that are still successful, that are working inside of them, um, focusing really on that quality of life. And the songs that come out are as individual as the families. looked forward um, to talking about this and it, to me this is something in this whole process that has been positive. Brian was able to um, use a stethoscope microphone and record my son's heartbeat. To be able to have that and carry that around on my phone is his heartbeat, you know what I mean? I can listen to his heartbeat whenever I choose to. Our son was dying uh, in front of us and it was very tough. So just to hear that music, uh, it really, really got my spirits up, uh, and I needed that. You know, you have to go through the processes and, and all of the emotions that, that go along with it, and music is a good guide to help you through that. It is for me. It's amazing to hear Brian say that his job is to add to the humanity of healthcare. And that's what we're asking people to do, is to find resilience in yourself so that you can be like Brian. Brian, who you may have recognized was the person who was playing the guitar and leading us in this morning here into the forum, made Dylan's family's life just a little bit easier by thinking in a new way about how does he add his technical skill to the humanity of healthcare. So we've got lots to celebrate in our healthcare world and lots left to do, but Derek's going to take us through that transition from healthcare to health. Thank you, Maureen. And we will be right at your side as we try and improve healthcare, but we also want to work with you to improve health. And now, six years on from the launch of the Triple Aim, we haven't heard as much feedback from people, so much reinforcement of AAA thinking as we have in the last 12 months. It's become a, an organizing framework for reform, and it brings tremendous new opportunities for us to work on improving health care and improving health. And when we talk about health, we mean health for all, for the insured and the uninsured, for black and brown and white, for rich, and poor. And there's compelling evidence that to make a difference, we need to address the social determinants of health. A 25-year-old with a bachelor's degree will live nine years longer than a peer who doesn't get their high school diploma. The social determinants of health are such that healthcare can't do this work alone. But there's so much, so much that the people in this room can do. We can bring our will our ideas and our knowledge of improvement science to bear, to, track, to tackle these previously intractable problems. We do need to be a better partner for communities. We do need to develop the humility to listen to what communities are telling us and to support them. And it, it does require courage. My friend and colleague Jason Leach first shared this slide with me. This is the level of bravery that's required. <laughs> so we need to be brave. We need to be humble, but we need to be brave. There's a path to be set, and we need to set it. When we found our courage at IHI, we realized that part of what was holding us back was that we couldn't escape this gravitational pull of, kind of circling around the same issues again and again. And our theory was that if we could achieve 
what we called escape velocity. If we could get out of that orbit, then we would have a chance. And our theory was that one of the ways to escape would be to set an audacious goal. And so we convened partners, because we had the humility to accept that we couldn't do this alone. We convened partners in October. IHI strategic partners, Leadership Alliance members, community organizations, public health experts, and a set of Latino children with Down syndrome who danced for us to show what health meant for them. It was a fabulous meeting. It was an inspiring meeting. And we formed a guiding coalition from that meeting. And there are now 60 plus organizations committed to really making a difference for health and committed to a truly audacious goal. Now, Gary referred to this in his introduction, but just pause for a second to think of the audacity of this. To have 100 million people living healthier lives by 2020. And we are very serious about this. The coalition members are committed to implementation. Well, the guiding coalition is serious about um, delivering on this commitment. And we think there are probably four parts to that. There's the audacious goal itself, um, which is uh, an important component. But, and on, on top of the audacious goal, we need the catalytic social movement that will engage people, their hearts and their minds, and will change the culture. And we need a unifying coalition that will pull all of this fantastic work together in communities. And we need a campaign that's designed to achieve a measurable goal. And we think if we can do these four things, we will succeed. We will reach 100 million healthier lives. What does that mean for us in healthcare, for us in this room? It means a new dialogue, it means a new understanding, and it means a new prescription, I think. And many of you have already started down that path, and I want to recognize that. I had the great privilege and pleasure to visit uh, Richmond Medical Center with Contra Costa County's inspiring CEO, Anna Roth. Anna and our team have looked deeply at the health needs of their community. They've really tried to deeply understand what their community needs. And they asked them about the barriers to health. And these are the things that the community told them. 62% of people in that community experience food as a barrier to health. Hunger was a barrier to health. Housing was a barrier to health. Jobs were a barrier to health. They needed help with bills. And of course they wanted excellent emergency medical care, but they needed help with jobs and food and bills as well. And so we know that physicians and clinical teams want to do things differently, want a new prescription, want to be able to meet social needs and medical needs. So let's help them. Let's use our collective voice in the 100 million Healthier Lives campaign. Let's help people in communities find their feet and their energy too. And let's think about those social determinants of health and those social needs that people um, have and that we have a duty to fill. And we'll know things have changed when we see ads like this on the TV. <laughs> I look forward to that day, don't you, Maureen? <laughs> so let's move to our second and, our second way to, to succeed in the new world. And that is about uh, reducing costs and improving quality. Uh, so this is, a, this is definitely an and. It's entirely possible that you might start your journey with one or the other, but choosing between cost reduction or quality improvement, improvement isn't a smart choice. We can't afford quality at any price. And we can't afford to sacrifice quality to cut costs. But sometimes the problem is, where do we start? And so one place to start is with waste. There was a recent Institute of Medicine report. Many of you will have seen it. It identified that something like a third of healthcare spending doesn't improve health. $750 billion worth in the US of healthcare spending that's not improving health. 
And we've seen similar studies with similar results in other parts of the world. There was a recent one from the UK. And one of the things that comes up again and again in those reports is this notion of overuse. And we just want to focus on one aspect of overuse in, in this section of the, the, uh, the talk, and that's really around medications. Um, Maureen and I got to speak to a really well-meaning and motivated physician recently. She was telling us of her challenges with an elderly patient. Uh, and the patient was on, on 29, I think, 29 prescribed drugs. And she was a falls risk, the patient. Um, but, but the issue was, um, the issue she was trying to fix was about adherence, really. It, was, it wasn't about reducing the burden of those prescribed drugs, it was about adherence. She was only adhering to 19 of the 29 reliably. And they wanted the way to get the other 10 reliably in place. They asked us for advice. I gave them two pieces of advice. It's always a risk to ask me for advice. The first piece of advice I gave, I said, if I was on 29 drugs, I would be a falls risk. I would be falling down quite a lot, I think, if I was taking 29 drugs. But the other thing we said is, let's think differently about this. Let's think about whether there are five or 10 drugs that might actually be beneficial for that patient. And let's put some support around them, a friend, a companion, someone they can talk to about their condition. But here again, we see bright spots. And I want to tell you about one of those that we saw in Kaiser Permanente's Southern California region. They've been tackling what they, they call there the opioid epidemic. And many of you will be familiar with the significant growth in uh, sales of opioids and the impact of that, which is as, as it leaks into the community to lead to significant increases in admissions and significant increases in deaths. To the extent that pain and anxiety drugs cause more deaths than heroin and cocaine alone, uh, uh, sorry, combined, and prescription deaths now outnumber traffic fatalities in the United States. So our colleagues in Kaiser Permanente, Southern California, set about tackling that issue. They were committed to do something about it under some fantastic leadership from physicians like Dr. Joel Hyatt and Dr. Michael Cantor and others. They created a program that was framed in the triple aim. It was really about better health, better costs, better care at lower costs. And they got to work on implementation. When they looked at the evidence, they found strong evidence that opioid use was um, advised in cancer and acute pain, less so in chronic pain. They engaged a range of leaders. They started to have different conversations. They developed new practices, new guidance, new bundles. The results are stunning. A 90% reduction in OxyContin in that community, significantly lower costs, and, and, and maintaining very high performance in effective pain management. Maureen, you have another story for us. So again, sometimes I think we'll take the approach as Kaiser Permanente did to say we're going to reduce, uh, we're going to improve quality and then reduce costs. And sometimes we could take the other approach. This year with Robert Kaplan from the Harvard Business School, we launched a joint replacement learning community. We brought together 32 uh, hospitals around the United States and abroad who came together because joint replacement is, as you probably know, the fastest growing procedure uh, worldwide. Total knee replacements are going to increase by 673% between now and 2030, which means that there'll be 3.5 million procedures like this each year. And total hip replacement is just behind it. So this would be a great place for us to come together and launch a collaborative that will demonstrate that we can improve quality at the same time we reduce cost. When we came together with these teams, we found that we needed to create a new value equation. So we defined value in this way. And on the top part of the equation, where we're talking about quality, we're not just talking about 
a safe hospitalization with no infection or uh, no medication errors. We're talking about full functionality at home. We're talking about measuring effective pain management throughout the whole journey. And we're talking about getting the patient into the right place post-discharge that they want. It's really a very broad definition, a patient-reported outcome. And at the bottom, we're looking at total cost. One of the most exciting things about this collaborative for me is that we brought together a very diverse group of people from each hospital. It included finance people, orthopedic surgeons, nurses, therapists, and when they came together, in almost every case, we found that they had never worked together on a project like this. They needed to learn each other's language to begin with. We had the finance people as an example who were walking through the whole journey of a patient experience. They were watching pre-op and watching operations and post-anesthesia recovery all the way to mobility. And they were blown away by the complexity of care, by the technical uh, knowledge and skill that was needed by the team, and by the compassion that they saw given to the patients. On the orthopedic side, on the orthopedic surgeon side, they were looking at variations that they had never seen before in length of stay, in the time of the operative procedure, in the supplies used. So it created a dialogue across all of these people, across all of these teams that produced these results. What we're seeing here now is much shorter lengths of stay, dramatic improvements in the percent of patients who were discharged to home directly, not to a rehab or a nursing home. Improvements in operating room flow and efficiency that are allowing more procedures to take place in the same capital uh, uh, building and equipment, and decreases in consumable supplies. Just to wrap up on this story, though, look at where the innovations came. Many of the innovations that produced these downstream outcomes happened in the beginning part of the process, really changing the way that hospitals did pre-op education and preparation, doing prehab rather than rehab. And I guess one of the ones that I found most interesting was creating what the teams came to call the culture of mobility. What they said is that everybody's job on this team is getting these patients to be mobile. It might be that the orthopedic surgeon walks the patient to the bathroom when they're in there in the morning. Or it might be that the nurses adjust their schedule with PT so that early mobility can happen on the day of surgery. But everybody thinking with the patient and the family about goals per day about mobility is producing decreases in length of stay, early functional restoration, and getting people to the triple aim of really being healthier at home, having a wonderful experience of care, and driving down costs on an average of 5% in this first year. So we're really excited to launch our next phase of this work next month. And I think that we can look to the next nine fastest growing DRGs and begin to make dramatic improvements in outcomes and care as we take substantial costs out of the system. Derek. Thank you, Maureen. And that really takes us to our third. And, and this came to us this year from our Leadership Alliance members, who, who when we were, we were exploring with them what were the issues that we really needed to work on, they, they talked to us about restoring joy to their staff, and they talked to us about increasing joy in their patients. And they guided us towards this third way to thrive in the new world which is to work on joy for patients and joy for staff. So let's start with joy for patients. What are the things that we might be able to do there? Well, I think this is one of these territories which Maureen talked about earlier. This is definitely something that you can do. Indeed, I think it probably is the case that everyone should try. It can and should start with you. But where to start? Well, a few years ago, Susan Edgman Levitan and Michael Barry first started to urge us to move beyond what, what's the matter, medicine, to explore what matters to you. And Maureen has been a fantastic champion for this idea. Uh, last year, she told you about Jen Rogers, a nurse in Glasgow, who was introducing what matters to you in our pediatric hospital. Uh, incidentally, Jen has had a neonatal experience of her own recently. She gave birth to twins yesterday. Ferguson, Robin, all are doing well. Um, 
but she continued her work. And, and she still has all of the children in our, in our uh, pediatric wards doing posters like these ones, expressing what matters to them in a way that engages them and involves them in their care. But she didn't stop there. She started to talk to colleagues in our uh, uh, geriatric hospital, in the neighboring hospital. And she shared the idea and the principle with uh, her colleagues, and they introduced it in the geriatric wards. And our colleague tells, of us, uh, tells us a story about an old lady, apparently confused, at restless, in and out of bed, again at risk of a fall, crying all of the time. And the staff not sure what to do about it. And it wasn't until they asked the question to, to the lady and our daughter, what matters to you, that they found out what she really needed were her rosary beads. That's what she wanted, and as soon as she had them, she was settled, she was calm, she was engaged in her care. It's the importance of finding out what matters to you. We've also heard recently about uh, a consultant in uh, Belfast Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, Aideen Keeney. She heard these stories, and she introduced the concept with her team. She enlisted the help of Daisy the Cow, to start a movement. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> Good. And so the, Daisy appears on all of the kids' pictures. This is one from Tammy, who's 10. She's going to surgery today, and she's telling people she wants to get to sleep in her own bed. Um, she wants some drinks with her medications, and she wants someone to tell her jokes as she goes off to sleep. As you can tell from my joke-telling ability, I'm well qualified for that. I can, <laughs> I can tell jokes that get people off to sleep. <laughs> so could we start a movement, do you think? We would need your help. Um, and I think we should push the boundaries of this. I'm not sure, however, we should push the boundaries quite as far as junior doctors in Denmark who are getting tattoos as part of the High Healthcare Project to proclaim that they are partners with patients. And if you think I'm not being serious about this, you should ask Beth Lilia from the Danish Society for Patient Safety to show you her tattoo. They are removable, so <laughs> no need to worry too much. And I, I think we should probably stop short of tattoos. What do you think? I think so. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but we can't stop short of getting joy in our workforce. D joy is definitely an and thing. It's definitely not an or thing. All of us came into healthcare to provide care, compassion, and empathy. And yet so many times people are finding that it's a struggle. You remember uh, Derek talking about Aileen and Ardine. Uh, they found joy by asking what matters to you. Having these conversations with the patients restored their joy. But we bring this up today because the levels of burnout in healthcare professionals right now are at an all-time high. This isn't just a US problem. This is a global problem. It relates to the many transitions in care that we're all going through, the introduction of electronic records, the introduction of evidence at a pace that is impossible to keep up with, new technologies, increasing burden of illness on patients, Coming into work today is a very different thing, and we haven't got the structural change in place yet, so we are seeing burnout that right now is associated with decreases in safety, decreases in patient adherence to medication, and certainly decreases in patient satisfaction. Brian Sexton recently shared this idea, and I wonder if anybody can relate to this. When you're at work, you're exhausted and thinking about being home in bed, and when you're at home, in bed, you wake up and all you can think about is work. Anybody relate? Me. Yeah. <laughs> Last night, anyway, that's for sure. <laughs> so I think we really need to focus on joy in our staff. You might have seen this uh, recent article from the Harvard Business Review that talks about being happy at work. And a lot of times in the past, we thought happy wasn't really important. Skilled, competent, that was important. But it turns out that being happy at work, having strong and resilient relationships with each other does matter because it allows us to work on our own stress. As you know, 
Working in healthcare is physically demanding, it's emotionally draining, and it's intellectually challenging. It's one of the most difficult jobs that you can find around the world. And so we need to understand that and work on our own resilience. It makes me think about Rosenbeth Moss Cantor's uh, quote that she says, resilience is the meta skill of the future. So if we can focus on joy, I do think we're going to have a huge step forward. If you come to visit, or when you come to visit IHI in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when you come into the office, the first thing you see is our mission. And you'll see it says, we will improve the lives of patients, will improve the health of communities, and the joy of the healthcare workforce. And I can't tell you how many times people come into the office and they're struck by seeing that word joy in an office. So when you come in, we're telling you we care about joy. And when you leave at work each day, Hans Hartug, one of our fellows, created a research project and an improvement project for us. So when the staff are leaving each day, we ask them to think back about the day. And if they had a day of joy, if they made progress, if they felt meaning and purpose in their work, they pick one of these beads, one color bead, and put it in the silver tin bucket. If they had a day of setbacks, if they had time issues or constraints, if they didn't feel joy in work, they take a different color bead. And each week we're looking at run shots to find out where are we holding people back from joy, and we're running PDSA cycles to try and improve the joy of the workforce at IHI. It matters to us because our mission is huge, improving health and healthcare worldwide. And if we can't find joy and resilience in our work, we'll never get to our mission. So I ask you to think about this and take on some responsibility, some personal challenges for us. What I'm seeing around the world is oftentimes people are focused right now on measurement and transparency. Measurement and transparency without improvement skills does not equal joy. If you start to look at data on a daily basis and you see the gaps, but you don't have the skills to close them, that's one of the key drivers, one of the key levers that De Derek and I are finding that contributes to burnout. So we're looking at care and compassion, but more improvement skills and innovation science so that people, when they see the data, when they see the gaps, they've got the skills to close them. We're looking at leaders who are going to take a step forward and begin to think about the structural changes that will allow people to thrive in the new environment. So we wanted to issue a call to action today. We wanted to ask each of you if every staff member, every community health worker, every clinician, when you're out meeting with a patient, could you stop and ask the question, what matters to you? Derek's given you some great examples about what happens, what learnings, what joy can be brought to you as a provider just by asking this question to patients. And what if every leader asked what matters to you to a staff member? And I think we will create a great sense of new learning, new ideas, and it's going to give us energy to restore joy in the work workplace. We're asking that you send us a short video or an email. I've got the link here on the, on the slide. Tell us the stories, because we do believe that we're going to come up with a new vision of what leadership looks like, a new vision about what care looks like from being able to learn from your experiences on the front line and to share those experiences very broadly with you on the website. So that takes us to our fourth and final and, and I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Thanks, Maureen. So when Maureen and I have seen these truly visionary companies, organizations that she spoke about in her introduction, um, we've seen that they're committed to improving health and care right across the age spectrum. But you very often see a focus on health and care for the young and health and care for the old. And so the fourth of our ways to thrive in the new world is to, is to try and, and improve health and care at the start of life and health, of, health and care at the end of life. So let's start at the start. For the last six years or so, Project Fives Alive has successfully deployed quality improvement approaches to assist Ghana's health system to accelerate ch child survival. In 2013, the project started the last phase of scale-up. 
And they're now at a level where they have 80% of the public and faith-based hospitals in the country uh, working to reduce mortality. Uh, so that's from a relatively humble beginning in three districts all the way through to 134 hospitals covering 80% of the country, 3.3 million children under five. And they just shared with us the most um, up-to-date results of the collaborative learning networks that have been established. Uh, 134 public and faith-based hospitals able to reduce mortality in those facilities by 28%. A huge undertaking and an, and an amazing success. And beyond that, they've, they've developed an infrastructure, a quality improvement infrastructure that can now sustain improvement in the country. They've created sustainable platforms. They've engaged new people in learning about improvement. And here you can see some of that design underway, where you can see a community health nurse a community health volunteer, and a traditional birth attendant all coming together to map and redesign the pathway for a mother who goes into labor at home to get her under the care of a skilled birth attendant. It's fabulous work. And in my home country of Scotland, there's a program with a huge ambition that Gary touched on in his introduction. This is the Early Years Collaborative, aimed at making Scotland the best place in the world to... What are you laughing at? <laughs> We're excited. It's okay to be excited. So aimed at making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up, the first big aim to be met, if we're going to try and do that, is to reduce infant mortality and stillbirths by 15% by 2015. And that work is far from finished, but the early results are quite promising. The, uh, the stillbirth rate is reducing. We've had the first real shift in the data for 10 years, so early promise there. But actually, the stuff I want to talk to you about is really about what this program is trying to do with, with health for the early years. Because the real power in this approach is about the way in which it gets healthcare workers and school teachers and kindergarten teachers and police officers working together to bring the best out in their communities. So improvements in bedtime reading so that and social attachment and readiness to learn can be improved. Using improvement signs to more quickly find a permanent home for an at-risk child. Using improvement skills to, to raise parenting skills. And I think that's the way that we have to go. We have to engage all of the assets in the community, as Maureen was telling us earlier. And so we wrap up on health and care at the end of life. There are some great lessons that we can use here to reduce health disparities and health inequities across the country. We can think about them in the early years, in the middle ages, and at the end of life. I think in 2015, this focus on reducing health disparities at all parts of life is going to be critical. But I'll wrap up this afternoon, by, by this morning, by talking about the, the, early, the later years in life. What we're finding is that the most rapid growing piece of our population are the elderly, and that many of them are living at home. The older people want to be living and thriving in their communities, and as Jenny Chin Hansen, one of our board members says, the, the older folks are looking at living their lives. They're looking at 365 days a year of life. They're not focused on the design of the five days a year, perhaps when they might be in a hospital. So let's think about how do we take up Jenny's charge and keep the older people in our communities healthy at home. You might remember me talking at a prior forum about Esther, the, our colleagues who are here from Jönköping County in Sweden. 20 years ago, we're trying to figure out the answers to this question, how do we keep people vital at home. And they created a fictional person, they called her Esther, and they began to look at her journey through care in the typical course of a year. All of the carers came together and redesigned care to keep Esther vital at home. It's been an amazing project that required redesigns in the way that everybody worked. But Esther, 20 years later, is still 88, still thriving at home. And I would encourage don't, you... Don't you wish? 
yeah, yeah. I would encourage you to find an Esther, to begin to think about redesign by using something like this. It's so innovative that just a few weeks ago, CNN went on a worldwide mission to find the most innovative, in, the most innovative places to live on Earth. And they picked seven cool innovations, and Esther was one. So all of our colleagues in Sweden deserve a huge round of applause for, <laughs> for helping us to see the way to keep older people vital at home or in the community wherever they want. Now, elderly people will get sick. And when they do, they need a different kind of innovation. In Montgomery County in Maryland, we're seeing innovators come together and they're learning in one apartment building, one subsidized apartment building, where are the risks for these elderly patients and when might they need help? How can they work in a different way to keep them healthy at home in their apartments? A multidisciplinary team of an EMT, a pharmacist, and a physician are studying each patient and they're looking at risks. They're looking at when are these patients, these people, most at risk for becoming patients. And they're transforming the way that they care for these people with counselors in the apartment building. It's as Tom Nolan would say, if you learn for the one, then you can manage the population. So learn for one patient where are the risks and then extrapolate that to the, uh, the apartment building and then this can be spread to the whole county and it will be an Esther project, I think, in the making. And at the end of life, when care may not be the right answer, I think we need to think in a very different way about we, how we approach end of life. There is a physician I want to introduce you to this morning. His name is Dr. Lachlan Faro and some years ago, I named Dr. Faro the doctor for your soul. I think if you watch this short video, you'll see how Lachlan approaches care at the end of life in a very different way. Doctors and hospitals really aren't what we call conversation ready because we ourselves have so medicalized everything that I'm seeing for this patient. What's the dose of this medicine? What's the chemotherapy or not with this test or not? Uh, that we ourselves don't actually often have the experience, the practice, the support that we need to sit down with a patient as a human being, understand what's important to them as a human being, and make sure that that's always at the center of every medical plan. I was asked to see Thelma Vitello. All that I knew was she was a 92-year-old woman who had severe vascular circulation problems in her leg, causing her lots of problems for which there wasn't going to be any effective treatment that they could offer except an amputation, but she just refused. She wasn't going to have that done. And so they said she didn't have that long to live, and so they wanted me to come by and maybe talk to her about hospice kind of options. What I remember, I guess, most strikingly was that Dr. Faro asked her, you know, what, what would be a good day for you? And so I sat down on the bed. I said, getting to know you some as a person, will help me figure out how I can best help you. And it's such a simple question. You know, what would be a good day for you? What do you like to do? These things that I don't feel like I have time, honestly, on a daily basis when I'm seeing patients, when I'm on call, um, to ask the, you know, these little things. In whatever time there is ahead for you, how can we make that as good as it possibly can be for you? Singing is what made it a good day. But it didn't take that long to find out that this is what was important to her. I said, when was the last time that you sang? And she just sort of said, I haven't sung in a long time. I don't, I, I don't sing anymore. I said, why not? And she kind of looked at me and I said, uh, how about singing me a song? I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I say to myself, what did they die? <laughs> what a wonderful world. Somebody, where's the drama? I see skies of blue. I see skies of blue. Clouds of blue. Clouds of blue. The bright blessed, the bright, blessed, blessed sun. sun. And the dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. 
And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Ba -ba 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 oh, yeah. And it made such a huge difference in the day. The music was right there as vividly as it, as it had ever been. And every time her voice started to sing, you could just see her eyes getting younger, her face getting younger, and the kind of human joy returning. So when you walk into a room, do you see a 92-year-old patient with a clinical vascular problem, or can you see Dolly? And I think that's the magic of the way that Lachlan cares for health and healthcare by asking the simple question. Improving health and healthcare worldwide is going to require us to think in many new ways. We're going to have to extend the periphery of our vision. We're going to have to start working in partnership as Derek has said, with people who may not be in our sphere right now. We're going to be working on accelerating healthcare, the improvement of healthcare, and working on health at the same time. So we've got our challenges cut out for you. We might need new roles. We might need, as an example, to create upstreamists, people whose job is to prevent healthcare problems. We might need diffusionists, as as Steve Swenson has in, I, implemented at Mayo Clinic, people whose job it is to make sure that spread happens quickly and reliably to every part of the system. We might need extensivists who are caring for patients like Dolly who are at the most frail part and vulnerable parts of their life. We'll need new ways to look at data. In an ACO, you might be looking at data for all of the diabetic patients in your panel. You might be looking at a very high level view of how am I doing with all my cardiac patients. And you'll know what, how many there are and, and where they are. But right down to the individual level, we're gonna know a great deal more about each individual patient. You'll know the clinical lab results and the x-ray results, blood pressure and vital signs. But you'll also know perhaps that a 50-year-old man who's been pretty stable is undergoing a, has lost his job and is going through a divorce. That's going to require a different kind of medical interaction, a different kind of health interaction if we're going to keep him vital at work. So we're going to start to look through new lenses like North Shore LIJ where they put out, they're looking at data to predict and to plan for care even before it's needed. Or Kaiser Permanente where when a patient comes in for a visit, they know everything about that patient, everything that's happened, and everything that's going to need to happen in the next months in order to produce the best care. So as we go out today, I'm going to ask you to think about all teach and all learn, and we're going to put out a challenge about your and. Think about what is it that you will add to your portfolio when you go back. What ands do you want? And we're going to put up a hashtag for you and ask you to, to tweet your ands. Tweet your and to uh, hashtag IHI26forum and be thinking about this. How do we move from or thinking to and thinking? Derek, do you have an and? I do, I have an and. I, I think part of the challenge in this is going to be for leadership. And so my and is really about what kind of new leadership we'll need. And I think their leaders will need to be comfortable with complexity and generous with power. And so my and is comfortable with complexity and generous with power. What's your and, Maureen? So my and is going to be how do we optimize a visit, which might be two times a year, and create health by having everybody here in the room think about health two times a day, two times a year and two times a day. So tweet us your, your ands. And as we send you off today to the rest of the forum, we're going to ask you to do a couple of things. This is your homework, so to speak. First, we're going to ask you to ask a family member or a colleague what makes a good day. I think you'll be surprised at the answers. Next, we're going to ask you to look out and find who's doing something better. Find the curiosity in your life as you're here at the forum to say who's doing it better and how can I close that gap. 
Third, we're going to ask you to build your own resilience, to think about yourselves every single day. Build your own resilience, build your joy. It will be the way that you're able then to provide care for others. And lastly, ask the next patient you see what matters to you. As we send you off with all of these ands, I think those four questions will really help in a huge way to begin to balance the complicated work we've got ahead. So as we move to close our session here today, we've asked Brian to share with us, to remind us about what Dolly said. What a wonderful life it is. Thank you all. It's a great honor to be here. And the sound that you're hearing right now is Maureen's heartbeat. And we're going to use that and use her heart to lead us through the song. So I would invite you to share and have some fun with me by singing. So if you know the words, please join in, okay? I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Come on, I don't hear anybody. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, bright blessed day, dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. There you go. All right, let's have a little fun. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They really sing, I love you. There we go. I hear babies cry. We'll watch them grow. They'll know much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. All right, one more time. Right, Dolly, just like Dolly. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. All right, now, big finale. Come on, like Louis Armstrong, okay? Oh. 